Well, hi, fellow music lovers and explorers. Um, welcome back to uh, Musing Music. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to pay special homage to that woman over there, Audrey Hepburn, who was the uh, shining example of uh, genetic perfection on the planet. Most beautiful woman, to my mind, that ever lived. And uh, I'll always love her. Anyway, uh, so today I'm going to fly by the seat of my pants. I don't have any notes for this. Uh, I did make a 30-minute video, as I mentioned, my recent uh, recent blues video, uh, the Parallel Relative Switch. I made a 30-minute video uh, yesterday on this computer, and I went to upload it. And for some reason, it was composed of zero bytes. So I, I don't know what happened to the damn thing. Today we are going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about, um, the overwhelming, overriding, quintessential, vast importance of the blues. And uh, like so many species that are dying on the planet right now, uh, going extinct, the blues is uh, fast becoming a museum piece. And uh, this is a very, very great loss. Um, there's a, there's a really good music theorist, uh, music explainer type um, by the name of Howard Goodall. And uh, one reason I respect him is because he did a whole segment. He was a classically trained guy, and he did a whole segment on the Beatles. He did a YouTube video. Look it up, Howard Goodall, G-O-O-D-A-L-L. -L. And um, I really fell in love with this guy because he, um, you know, he's classically trained, and he does respect what the Beatles did in terms of chord movement and the architecture of a piece of music. Um, but uh, nonetheless, he wrote a book that I read. In fact, this is where I started with the guy. He, uh, the book was called Big Bangs, Five Inventions That Changed Music Forever. And among uh, one of the big inventions in which I speak about is temperament, the temperament of the scale. Without the temperament of the scale, we couldn't have the richness and interaction of keys that we have today. However, given that fact, if you looked at my 432 video, all our music, all of it, is without a tune. So that's just the case. Um, we have to make do with that. Yet, the human mind is so creative and so amazing that it could take this out of tune chromatic scale that we have and still make something so beautiful that you could be moved to tears or chills running up and down your spine. Um, I know uh, that happened to me on a number of Beatles songs. So one of them was the. Yeah, seemingly trite song, Hello, Goodbye, but when I heard the the way all the instruments were placed with the violins and the backup vocals and Paul's bass kind of punctuating these lines, it was just, it would, I, as a kid, I had the 45 uh, record and I would play it over and over again just to feel the chills up and down my spine. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is one of the reasons the Beatles affected me from the very get-go. I was a young boy and I guess... You know, you're impressionable at that age, so certain things just stick with you forever, and the Beatles stuck with me. But it's not just sentimental or nostalgic. I'm I'm a very intense music theorist, and I look deeply into what they've done, and it is unbelievably great. Now, you know, the reason I started the whole uh, Beatles series was because I had this one student that I, I would tell him about the blues, and I say, you know, there's a difference, a distinct difference between blues harmony and European harmony, um, that uh, you can look at a Beatles song and, uh, you know, the verse might be blues harmony, the chorus might be European harmony, back and forth like that. Uh, so basically the way that these videos started was I'd say, okay, this song, you can hear the verse is blues based and you hear, hear the bridge is European based, so on and so forth. Um, an example of that would be I Feel Fine. Um, let me get my guitar, which has 5-4-1 dominant seventh chords. Um, well, my hands are all lit up in the sunlight. Um, so that's all blues, uh, you know, literally. Right. So uh, that that is a blues progression, no doubt, because the, the really important earmarks, again, are one as dominant seven and four as dominant seven. And again, there is no scale 
that contains those two chords. And if you were to force a scale to happen, it would be bogus as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm very conservative about what you call a scale. Um, anyway, the bridge goes... Oh, sorry. One, uh, one, three, four, five. Okay, and that's definitely European harmony. So the Beatles moved between those two. And um, of course, you know, if you were a kid growing up in Liverpool in those days, um, the overriding music would have been based on European classical theory. So when they heard this American music, they tried their best to emulate it. And then they discovered it's the seventh chords that really do it. Um, anyway, um, if you look at the late 50s, early 60s music, um, you can hear that in a lot of a lot of the pop music is that there's blues influence and European harmony influence blended into one pop song. You can hear it in Motown, um, all over the map. You can hear it everywhere. Um, the interesting one point I kind of want to make is like the if we look at the Greek modes, the seventh chord sits at the fifth step, and that creates what's called a Mixolydian scale, which gives you a flatted seventh instead of do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, you get flat seven, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, T flat, do, which is called te in uh, solfege language. All right, but you notice that doesn't sound bluesy. The blues convention is minor against major, and so if I took the note that denotes major, which, by the way, is always a third note of the scale that tells you whether it's a minor scale or major scale. If it's a step and if the third note of the scale is a step and a half away from the root note, uh, it's a minor scale. And if it's two whole steps away from the root note, it's a major scale. So but what blues does is it does this radical new thing of blending minor and major. So if I were to do the Mixolydian scale, but then add the minor note to it as I traverse upward. So I get one, two, flat, three, three. Right away, you can hear the blues in that. As soon as we add that one little minor note. So and I've, I've talked about this throughout my blues series that uh, uh, such a chord as the very super cool sharp nine chord, which is this. Uh, couldn't exist uh, without the blues principle, which is minor against major. And why is that? Because in that chord, there's a major note, two whole steps away. And an octave higher, there's a minor note. If I remove the third, major third from that chord and put in the minor, I'd get a minor chord. Okay. That chord right there, very, very, very important. Now, uh, that's one of the innovations that the blues brought about was the use of the sharp nine as a valid chord unto itself. Now, not to say that it wasn't used before blues. Um, certainly, um, Bach, if you want to look up uh, Rick Beato's uh, talk about Bach, it was pretty amazing. Uh, in that video, he talked about a major seven sharp five chord, which is very abstract chord, which Bach actually used. But not only that, when I was in college, we did analysis of Bach's counterpoint. We'd freeze a section and look at the series of notes that were right there. And I'll be damned. I found sharp nine chords. I found 13 flat nine chords inside of Bach's music. But the thing was, this was in passing and certainly for by no means would Bach have outrightly hit that as one chord. It, it went through passing. Uh, how do I say? Like there are four voices singing, four-part harmony, different lines. And as they travel through, that chord might pass through. But he'd never literally sit on one of those chords, uh, especially the sharp nine or flat nine chords. Well, maybe the flat nine. Um, but in any case... Uh, Definitely, but you wouldn't hear Bach doing as a root chord. That simply would not happen. All right. Now, the sharp nine chord in the blues happens on the one and the five. Okay. Now, that sound, that sound of minor against major, what's going on today is that the kids are 
are looking, uh, listening to that sound and thinking of it as old school, old fashioned sounding. And this is a really big problem because we go into Howard Goodall's book, The Five Inventions That Changed Music Forever. One of them was temperament. But then he goes on, all right, the piano, that was a, an important invention. But then he goes on to cite opera and uh, what else was it? I forget what his other two inventions were, but maybe in Europe, opera was a big world changing event, but I, I don't see it that way. And what he neglected to put into that five would definitely, most definitely be blues. And you know, if I sat down and had a talk with the guy, I have a funny feeling he would agree with me on this. Um, the thing about what makes blues so important is because it changed the, the European harmonic sound. And what is going on, I'm going to kind of car caricaturize it because I'm, I'm sure not all contemporary composers are doing this, but I'm talking about popular music now, which uh, seems to be the brunt of it is EDM, electronic pop music, and, uh, and hip hop. And uh, the samples that I've heard as I walk past some st stores that play this music uh, on the boardwalk here, it just sounds like utter shit to me. I mean, I'm sorry. It sounds like utter shit. Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I really am an old guy going, oh, these kids today, they don't know what music is. I mean, it's, it's partially true because when I was growing up, my, pe my parents' generation thought the Beatles and, and other rock music was silly and childish and noisy. Um, so maybe I'm just a stodgy old guy. But here's the thing. Whether I'm a stodgy old guy or not, I can tell you this much. There is no more blues left in music. Uh, if you want to um, go back to Rick Beato again, uh, he does a whole section on uh, Why Rock Died, it was called. I think it was called Why Rock and Roll Died. And he goes on this thing about how we lost the blues. I love Rick because he thinks right along my lines. The only difference between me and him is he's uh, – He's about making his money and selling his book uh, for really too much money. But uh, I'm not here to make money. I'm here to educate. And that's my prime purpose. Uh, so, again, getting back to the importance, the prime importance of the blues. Number one, especially for American composers, uh, the blues is extremely important for maintaining an American identity in music, an American sound. Now, unfortunately, the trend of the New World Order and what they're trying to promote is the homogenization of everything. In the future one day, when you think about coffee, you're only going to think about Starbucks um, and maybe two other coffee outlets. In the future, when you think about food, you're only going to think about Monsanto's products because they're going to own it. And... Uh, thing that really saddens me is this stuff is glaringly obvious and no one gives a shit. Just let me, you know, Netflix and chill and I'm fine. Fine. You know, it's the way it is. Uh, but this homogenization, uh, you know, they want no borderlines between countries. That's what they're hoping for, that all the world will be one country. But then, you know, and then you're considered racist if you point out the difference in another person's culture which is pure absurdity. Actually, the richness of our world is based on the differences and not on making everything the fucking same. And I could prove that musically, okay? If you give equal gravity to every one of the 12 notes in our system, meaning that you arrange the notes in such a way that none of them could be a root, okay? None of them could have the power of feeling like you came home. Uh, this happens when you force a scale to be symmetrical. In other words, like the whole tone scale is all whole steps. The diminished scale is whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step, following a pattern like that. These are both symmetrical scales. And when you hear them, I defy you to find a root. There's no real root to it. All right. And uh, there was, a, a, of course, a European composer that came along uh, by the name of Arnold, Arnold Schoenberg, who created the dodecaphonic system and uh, tone rows, which basically you have to exhaust every note before you ever repeat one of those notes. So C, E flat, I can't hit C again until I get through all the other 10 notes. And what that does is it causes no root to happen, all right? When you listen to this music, it is dissonance, dissonant music, okay? It, it's not a tune you can hum to. 
and the harmonies are, are painful. They, they're jarring to the nervous system. Nothing wrong with abstract music. I'm not saying that, but it provides an analogy for when you have a totally egalitarian world where everything is just so and everybody is equal, what you get is dissonance. So the New World Order, when they finally accomplish their plans, they're going to bump up against something they didn't expect, which is a ton of chaos that they won't be able to control. Uh, chaos, uh, order from chaos is not going to apply here because it's going to be too big a job. Uh, so anyway, the blues uh, has, first of all, we lose the blues, we lose the American identity in our music. Uh, secondly, we use we lose a, a form of music theory, a form of harmonic uh, organization that is perfectly as valid, valid as the European uh, model of harmony. Uh, the thing about the blues, there's something truly magical about blues because the blending of major and minor, major happy, minor sad. So you get bittersweet, happy, sad at the same time. And how does this operate? I know for me that uh, if I'm feeling down, uh, if I'm not feeling well, and I get to jam the blues with a bunch of musicians, and it's a really hot jam session, I will feel a certain emotional release from playing that. The blues is an emotional release. It, and also, uh, it leads to a celebration. Don't forget, when you, split, split up, when you speed up the blues, the 12-bar blues progression, what you get is something that was called rock and roll. And you have to listen to the really early versions of that, even before the Beatles or the very earliest Beatles, to get a sense of uh, it was very youthful music. It was joyful. It was about celebration and fun. And uh, I doubt the society is anywhere near close to being able to handle celebration and fun anymore. Uh, it's a sad, sad fact. We are, our world is turning to shit. Um, and it's been my, really my contention that what caught, part of what helped cause the revolution in the 60s was the music itself had a unifying power. It brought everybody together and these musicians themselves were basically in accord. They were anti-establishment. They were accord with that hippie uh, contention that the establishment is suppressing us and creating a false reality that we're, we, we're, we're forced to live through whether we want to or not. And so the hippies said, fuck y'all, we're going to start our own world. And uh, they were a bit idealistic. They did it kind of in a haphazard way. Uh, they should have had a plan. They didn't. And... Um, the whole thing fell apart through the CIA's clever introduction of heroin and cocaine into the drug mix, um, giving it to the hippies. The big mistake was they gave them acid. <laughs> they had to correct that mistake because they looked around them, the hippies, after taking acid, and they said, wait a second. This world you've created is such bullshit. It's so not human. Let's, uh, let's get back to being human beings, you know? So, uh, but you speed up the blues and you get uh, rock and roll, rhythm and blues. It becomes like party music. And again, the Mixolydian scale, uh, which the seventh chord is built upon and which is essential, quintessential to the blues, is uh, the, the Greek modes. The Greeks said this was the mode to party by, the Mixolydian mode. Um, you can't get, like I was going to say, you composers out there, so start composing using dominant seventh chords, whether it's blues or not, it will still create the mixolydian mode. Uh, but uh, uh, interesting thought here. I won't go into it. Uh, yeah, the thing is, though, you can't get past the record companies now. They're owned by lawyers. Um, these guys are sole purposes to make money. They know crap about what good music is. And uh, it's just such a waste. It's such a desert of bullshit. Uh, that's the way it is. Um, I grew up, I feel sorry for you younger guys, because I grew up in a time where I saw, like, the possibilities for humanity. Like, we had possibilities. We were hopeful. We, we really felt we could change things through music. And uh, that slowly got quashed and destroyed. And now it's pretty much impossible. Everything has been so compartmentalized. I saw this happening in the late 90s uh, with uh, electronic pop music. There were so many categories, and I look at these categories and go, what are they? 
Um, but uh, and I really didn't have interest in electronic music composing. Um, so we lose the blues. First of all, we're losing a music that has an American stamp to it, an American sound. We're losing the dominant seventh as root chord, which uh, gives us the Mixolydian scale, which brightens the spirits, according to the Greeks. We're losing a potent tradition for, it's almost like alchemical in its capacity to transform a human being's feelings from negative to positive. And God knows the powers that be don't want us positive. They don't want us hopeful. Um, and it's working. It's working quite well. Uh, what other importance does the blues have? Uh, we talked about the sharp nine chord blues harmony. Uh, that's pretty much it. You know, I just wanted to, like, preach this gospel. And, and you know, here's the thing. Like, the EDM composers, this is what they're doing now. These guys have no fucking training, all right? Even, even the rock and rollers of the 60s, eventually, because the Beatles were so great, they wanted to learn how they can transcend what the Beatles did and do better than the Beatles did. So what they reached out for was learning about music and how it works and how the harmony works and what made these songs so great. Um, so, uh, you know, that was going on in that, those days. Nowadays, education is nearly dead. You get these kids who have a home studio, they have a, a keyboard there, and they figure out how to create triads on the white keys. The easiest thing in the world is learning how to create a triad. When they look at those black keys, they don't know what the fuck, all right? And this is why you have these plain vanilla chord progressions that don't modulate, don't use from chords from other keys, because these they don't know what other keys are. Now, don't get me wrong, there's still good music and good musicians out there, but you talk about the underground, this is below the underground. This is, you can't find this stuff. It's hard to find it, you know? So, um, I don't know, maybe I'm just blowing off steam here. I'm, I'm, I'm pissed off about the loss of the blues, quite frankly, and we need it back in our music so badly. We don't need any more da 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 hip hop which all it does is emulate emulate the constant incessant chattering that exists in everybody's head it doesn't shut people's minds up it makes them talk more to themselves and the only way you can experience reality is if you shut your fucking mind up and look and see what's going on there not that anybody wants to do that uh because we're in a spiritually dead world as well wow i'm in a great mood today aren't i uh in any case um the blues is still out there, you know, you can still hear it. Um, what the, the EDM composers have, have to learn is how to use blues principles without having to sound old school, like old rock and roll or whatever. Uh, you know, I'm, I may seem closed minded uh, about music, about what, what composers are doing today, but quite honestly, I will tell you this. If I hear, heard a really great pop song by some 20 year old, I get really excited. I've yet to to find anything so far that can get me excited enough beyond one song, you know, that uh, was kind of a one hit wonder thing by some band. Uh, in any case, uh, yeah, that's it for today. Uh, I guess I went a little dark, so sorry about that. But, you know, the world needs to change. We need a positive infusion of something. God knows what. But if it doesn't happen soon, um, it's not going to be a fun world to live in. Anyway, blessings to you guys. Uh, if I don't make another video before Christmas and you're celebrating Christmas, of course, have a Merry Christmas and all that stuff. And uh, I will see you again. Oh, um, I spoke to a dear friend of mine, Matt Demerit, great um, tenor sax player. And in one of my musing music videos, I, I think we're going to talk about music as literally a spiritual path, not like a spiritual path, but is a spiritual path. And uh, Matt is an intense spiritual se seeker and intellectually he's done a lot of reading and stuff like that. Great guy. We've had hours and hours of discussion about spiritual uh, subjects and music subjects and, um, and the like. So uh, we'll see if we get that done. That'll be a lot of fun. Okay. Anyway, guys, take care, be well, and see you soon.